Hello and welcome everyone to this episode of the War of the Rebellion podcast for Age Civil War. I am today again here joined by my co-host and partner in crime, if you like. The national rivalry continues between myself, the German, Niels Eichhorn, and the Frenchman slash American, as we both are, Andrew Hauck, over in the central parts of France in his always beautiful office space. <laughs> and we're joined today by a Washington Husky, Raymond Jonas. He is professor of history and has a PhD from the Bears, University of California, Berkeley. We are going to talk today about a very, very interesting book that for me is very interesting based on my own work for Andrew, based on where he lives is very interesting, I suppose. And also, we both found this a highly engaging read. So we're going to talk with Ray today about Habsburgs on the Rio Grande, the rise and fall of the Second Mexican Empire, which came out in April with Harvard University Press. So first of all, Ray, thank you so much this morning for you and on the West Coast for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you. And so let's let's dive into this right away of like how how do you did you come to write a book about Maximilian, the Mexican Empire, and this whole quagmire that Mexico is in the 1860s? You know, it it was entirely an accident. Um I was uh, at a conference. My earlier book was on an, an element of the history of Ethiopia. The Battle of Adwa is the title of the book, African Victory in the Age of Empire. And I was going to Ethiopian uh, conferences and among scholars doing history and art and architecture. And those conferences meet in alternating years in Ethiopia and then outside Ethiopia. We met in Diradawa the year before <clears throat> and the year in question we met in, in Vienna and during a break in the, in the conference, I headed out uh, and took a walk and ended up on the Ringstrasse and dropped in the, to the Votivkirche, this you know nineteen you know neo Gothic um, church. And <clears throat> inside, I came across a a chapel. Drawn, I was just drawn by the light. There's just a, 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 you know an obvious attraction, sort of a glow coming from a side aisle. And I wandered over to see what it was. And there I saw the Virgin of Guadalupe. Hmm. And this may be the last thing I would expect to see in Vienna. It's a long way away from Mexico. I mean, for your listeners who are familiar with the Virgin of Guadalupe, you know, it is, you know, one of the, the core symbols of Mexico. In, a, in effect, the, the, if you like, the patron saint of Mexico. And I, I was just taken in by this. I, I was, it was such a dissonant experience. I later learned that it was a memorial chapel for Emperor Maximilian, which made sense. But the 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 feeling was so powerful, I I couldn't let it go, and I I was already looking at another project at the time. But by the time I left the Votiv Kirche, I was already thinking uh, that there was something here for me to work on. So so that was the origin, and I. Um, you know, it would require a certain amount of retooling, but I was fully engaged with the prospect of doing this. That's fascinating in part because living in Austria, I have only literally been twice, no, three times in Vienna. <laughs> and in all three instances, I was just zooming through, <laughs> uh, going to the airport, coming from the airport, picking up family at the airport so well over correct. the course of the project i you know i, I mean that I mean, that might that's often the conference experience too right you go to a right. city for a conference yeah. but you never get to see it um exactly. but of course and the course of research for this book i ended up going back uh, a couple of times and so i got to know vienna a little bit better you know it's a delightful place mm -hmm. um and you know getting to know archives and uh, museums and all the rest but uh, yes, it, it, you know, it 
you know, we like to think that we choose our topics, but in a lot of cases, our topics choose us. And that was yeah. certainly the case with this book. Oh, I bet. I bet. Um, so I'm going to do one more and then I let Andrew take over. So like, you're obviously not the first one to to write about Maximilian and Mexico and this whole, again, U.S. involvement, French involvement, and everything. What I sort of have an idea of, like, what's your greatest contribution is. But what do you see as sort of the great contribution of your book with regard to sort of the existing um, literature? Yeah, I think that what I bring to the story is the familiarity with European languages and archives, and that mm. makes a big difference in terms of what what I can bring in terms of sources. And that, and then I have an abiding interest in art and architecture, and there are elements of the story that rely on, you know, reading architecture, reading art. Uh, there's a lot of good historical information, even in bad art, and uh, there's a lot of bad art associated with this story. And I, um, you know, I those. You know, I, I think that's interesting as historians, you know, we, we there's, mm -hmm. there's part of us in the way we look at the world, and that's certainly the case here. In terms of the finished work, I think what that means is that you get a pretty vivid sense of how this is, yes, it's a Mexican story, but it's also a European story, and it's American story. It's a story that very much, where the U.S. is very much present. Uh, and I think it's a, that triangle is, is, what what makes this a transnational story? It's mm -hmm. you know it involves uh, profound um, connections uh, among these three entities uh, at a crucial moment, and that's why I think that's why I decided. And this is such an important topic. It seems ephemeral. I mean, the empire per se only lasts for three years, uh, and the intervention, as it's called, you know, a, only a, a bit longer than that. And that's part of why I think it's tended to be dismissed as a, mm -hmm. you know, as as something of no particular interest or importance. On the contrary, I think you know, even because it's maybe unique and ephemeral, there are some core issues here that deserve attention. And so, mm -hmm. in writing the book, I was you know trying to use this story as a way to bring the reader's attention to some issues that might otherwise be ignored. Mm -hmm. Well, the, um, the the art history and the uh, you can definitely feel that from the very beginning. Um, mm -hmm. And I, of the, if I do have one thing that I, I wish, one not criticism, but one thing I really wished that the book would have had would be a few color pictures, mm -hmm. because um, the triumph of Maximilian. God, yes. You talk about the about the carmine. Uh, you really need to see the red, and uh, you know I, I have it uh, on my on my left screen here because you know I really wanted to get the, the impression that you that you described so well uh, mm -hmm. in in the book, but and you have a, a black there's a black and white they included a black and white photo, but it, it's missing that core element which is the color red which mm -hmm. is of course the symbol of the cochineal uh, yeah. red Mexican. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I, uh, you know, reading, being able to read the home of Maximilian and Charlotte. You know, they have this this castle that they build, a uh, quite romantic castle, um, not far from Trieste on the Adriatic, and it it's pretty clear as newlyweds. I mean, they, they this is their home, and um, and they get to build it to specification, and they decorate it to specification, and what's really clear is that. How, how early on they were attracted to the idea of being emperor and empress of Mexico. And they really decorate this place as a, um, in a way that makes it clear that there's a program. There's an artistic program, there's an architectural program that all speaks to the grandeur of this vision that they have, that they are, they are going to save Mexico. They've been invited to save Mexico. They accept this in, uh, in earnestness and in good faith, and um, th this, of course, sets up the 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 the, the, the tragedy of of uh, ultimately of their endeavor. But at, um, but th they they have such a rich idea, and the triumph of Maximilian, this fresco, actually ceiling fresco, that's there at Miramare at their home near Trieste. Um, 
you know, captures it perfectly. I mean, there was Maximilian in the middle in the splendor, you know, with the the the, the allegories of the continents um, uh, around him, his ancestor Charles V, the Habsburg ruler who presided over, I mean, ultimately presided over Mexico when it was part of the vast uh, Habsburg global domains. You can see the imagination that's gone into this, and you can see how they've seduced themselves through this uh, vision of a restoration of Habsburg grandeur. Mm. Uh, you know, it, it's a positive message. You can that's quite clear. They 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 want to say, you know, this is what we're doing to revive the Habsburg dynasty and the Habsburg family and Habsburg glory. But of course, everything that they that they that they do in that regard is an oblique criticism of the Habsburgs. Who are actually in power, including Maximilian's brother Franz Joseph. I mean, you, you know, uh, it's a way of saying, "Look how far we've fallen!" Right? I mean, they yeah. it's, it's conveyed in a positive way. This is where we're going. This is the grandeur that we're going to restore. But it also speaks to the present in terms of decadence uh, and mm-hmm. decline. Uh, and it's a, it's you know, it's brilliant uh, as a program, but also nasty. In terms of, especially in terms of family politics, yeah. It's... So the, the the split between between Maximilian and his brother. I mean, uh, I, I yeah. knew that was coming, um, and I thought that it would be more frank. You know, uh, you know, siblings are interesting, and. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I I I understand both of these people. I think um, sometimes we, you know, our 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 feelings about siblings are, you know, in spite of, you know, what you've done or maybe what I've done, we still love each other. I think there's a an element of that there. They that they're not that far apart in age. I think they're important to each other. Um, I think from the point of view of Franz Josef, who's a much more practical, not to say stodgy figure, Maximilian's, you know, obviously a romantic and someone who's uh, weak when it comes to grand ideas um, and whose vanity uh, is, um, you know, a, an obvious defect in his armor uh, and makes him pray to the schemers who ultimately will uh, lure him to accept this challenge of the throne of Mexico. It's interesting that you, you you see him as sort of a romantic because I've seen like for like studies that look at him in like northern Italy when he's that brief brief stint there as governor and some of them say like oh he's very sympathetic to sort of the Italian national cause and liberal minded and um, it doesn't kind of square with that romantic kind of like scheming like desire but um that's how, true how do you how do you, how do you like like I'm, I don't want to nail you on like give me two words or three words, but how would you think of Maximilian? Sort of not just with Mexico, but in his entirety. Is he is he sort of like changing over time? Does his personality change based on what he is dealing with? Like, wh- wh- how should we think of this man? I think he sees himself in part as a um, as a kind of Renaissance man. I mean, he's. Be, you know, because of his high status, he becomes, in effect, head of the Austrian Navy. Uh, that's a heady experience right there. Yeah, five uh, he, boats, you know. Yeah, he, yeah, he's interested in, in botany. Um, and he's interested in insects. And he, in some ways, he sees himself, yeah, butterflies. He sees himself, I think, as a little bit of a Humboldt. Right, you have to think of the prestige oh my of gosh, yeah. in, in the 19th century. Yeah. Uh, Humboldt visited, of course, the Americas and Mexico in particular. Um, you know, I I think you know the prestige of Humboldt is part of what Maximilian seeks to emulate. Um, and then he's a liberal. I mean, his politics are mm-hmm. liberal in comparison with his brother Franz Joseph. He his politics that's not are, difficult. <laughs> no, that's true. Is you know his brother. <laughs> I mean, he's not a reactionary, maybe in the sense of an earlier generation, but he's pretty darn close. And, and then, of course, he's liberal. And part of the problem with his role as governor of uh, northern Italy, Lombardy and Venezia, is that he's far too liberal for mm-hmm. Vienna. And, yeah. uh, you know, he seems to be actually encouraging expectations of liberalization that the Austrian Empire, the Habsburgs have no intention of meeting. So he doesn't even last two years there before he's yanked out of Milan and replaced by, you know, an officer, a general. 
Yeah. Uh, and that's much more in keeping with how mm -hmm. Habsburgs look at their role as rulers of of, of Italy. I mean, they're going they're, they're going to do this by military force if necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was one of the questions that I had as well. Uh, reconciling all sorts of different, uh, uh, different uh, I, uh, ideas and different um, ideologies, ideologies and groups and yeah. um, things that are really polar opposites. Um, it's he is a very difficult place because he's somewhere in the middle, and he's trying to pull all these disparate parts together mm -hmm. to create something in this as you say romantic idea ideal um but i mean you open with uh matthew martin for uh, matthew fontaine mori this confederate guy who's going to you know who can't stand is that the idea of being you know reconstructed or being becoming a u.s citizen again renounces his, his citizenship becomes minister of colonization is that what it is mm -hmm. minister of colonization mm -hmm. um and then who's uh, whose policies or whose promises to former to, to Confederates, still slave owners in in, in his eyes, to bring their slaves, of, um, officially freedmen but under a peonage system, into Mexico, all at the same time, all while trying to entice more liberal-minded abolitionists groups as well so i'm thinking about the the prussian officer who the prussian the prussian immigrant immigrant who was fighting for the new york regiments who went to mexico as an abolitionist and so maximilian is trying to uh seduce both of these groups of people how well how successful is he well he's not very successful but um yeah yes i think the the maury story it is I mean, thanks for bringing that up because it really is you know it's crucial to understanding a couple of things first of all i open the book with his story because i want to bring you know i'm thinking of a reader maybe who doesn't know anything about mexican history or even or european history maybe he knows some u.s history and civil war history you know so for a civil war podcast maury is just the right guy you know and that's i'd start with him because you know as i say he really reveals the contradictions of the empire He's it's 1865. The Confederacy is defeated. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's overseas. He's, he's in London when Appomattox happens uh, and he begins to to, to come. He, he's going to leave London, but he's by far, uh, you know, he's not reconciled with the idea of living under federal rule. And, um, and he's trying to figure out what to do. He gets as far as Cuba and then decides to keep going to Mexico. Because of his interest, um, you know, Maury obviously is a great oceanographer. That's how he's mostly remembered today. But he is a Virginian and he did fight um, mostly in diplomatic ways for the Confederacy. And he's um, <clears throat> uh, the you know perfect. Um, he knew Maximilian through his work in oceanography. Remember, Maximilian is involved in the Austrian Navy. So they have this connection. And Maury builds on this to, to get himself a new gig as this. Uh, commissioner for colonization within the empire. Sure. That's what that's his that's his point of access to the empire. He goes to Mexican to Mexico City, and within a few weeks, he's commissioner of colonization. Mm -hmm. He's um, you know so he he's interesting in his own terms. He's interesting as a, a literary device because he gets the reader into a story that's maybe otherwise unfamiliar. And finally, because of his commitment to the southern cause and slavery in particular. He's, he ends up being someone who, who embodies what will become one of the contradictions of the empire. Because by the time he he arrives, Maximilian's liberal vision for Mexico is beginning to crumble, and he can't decide at that point. Does he want to? Uh, he's not. He, he, you know where he's going to go next. His liberal vision is failing because the liberal vision is already embodied by the Republic in Mexico, and by Juarez. So. Um, you know, if he can get the Confederates on his side, and Maury is promising, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of disgruntled Confederates are ready to leave mm. the United States and settle in Mexico. So uh, that sounds pretty promising, especially if these people can be effectively militarized uh, to, to defend the empire against internal enemies and against the United States. But 
in order to do that, he has to convince them that their investment in in labor and slave and slave labor is safe in Mexico, and that obliges him to, in effect, to subvert one of his core values, which is that slavery is an abomination, and and so he uses the Mexican practice of peonage, which is in fact not all that far from slavery, uh, to uh, to accommodate the this desire on the part of Confederates. You, allowing them to use peonage to control labor that they used to control directly through slavery. Well, um, speaking of peonage, then, and um, I think you make the you make the comparison to the black codes in the post emancipation South. Yeah, which is essentially it essentially establishes a, a system of peonage that does resemble that does resemble the, what Maximilian had in mind again for the Confederates coming to the. That's a great point, because what the Black Codes in Re Reconstruction South show is that you don't need to go to Mexico if you want to control your labor. You can uh, you can use sharecropping and you can use debt uh, and to to control labor and to keep them keep them local. Uh, and then, of course, you can use the Klan to keep them off the roads, keep them from from leaving. Uh, but but you could put together a system of controlled labor that doesn't require moving them to Imperial Mexico. Well, then it's legally protected as well. Yeah. And much more stable than <laughs> Civil War toward Mexico. So, um, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, they're, 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 I mean they're, the, you can tell that the expectations are high um, for migration. I mean, the news, there's a newspaper launched in Mexico, English language newspaper called the Mexican Times. Uh, which would turn out to be a valuable source for me. And, you know, the, it's pretty clear that thinking there's going to be a big English-speaking mm. readership that's going to settle in Mexico. And this is going to be the newspaper that is going to connect them as a community of expats who are now going to become Mexicans. And um, that gives you some idea of the, the grandeur of the vision, that alongside of, with the fact that of the drawings that are made for what settlement communities will look like what these settler colonies will look like at places near Puebla. Uh, and um, they, and then of course the migration that does occur by way of Texas across the border uh, down, down southward, um, you know, the, the, the reality doesn't quite match up to the expectations, but there is this profound sense that, yeah, this is going to be a migration. Maury, it should be said, Matthew Maury, the commissioner of, civil, of colonization, descends from Huguenots, and um, so he envisions, and, and Maximilian's right there with him, the idea that this is going to be an infusion of talent, just as the Huguenots, you know, uh, uh, played an important role in U.S. economic and social history, uh, you know, as intellectual leaders, as business leaders, you know, the DuPonts, the Bodouins, uh, and the Maury's, for that matter, um, you know, that, that now Mexico is going to benefit from this infusion of talent from disgruntled Confederates. They're gonna come, they're gonna bring their wealth, they're gonna bring their business know-how and they're gonna reinvigorate Mexico. In, uh, in a in positive way as opposed to right. being a drain on society. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible to say. <laughs> wow, hitting low there. <laughs> but I, I think that's also the key kind of like, when you think of it, like it's a key paradox again too, right? Where. It, so we have Maximilian. He comes to Mexico, which is a Catholic country. There's all this conflict of the Guardiola form with regard to like the land taking away from the Catholic Church, the army losing influence. And now we're inviting Confederates to come who are Protestant Anglo-Saxon settlers. We have what you have looked at before, like the these Ethiopian, Sudanese soldiers from Africa, you have Belgium, you have Austrian, German volunteers, French troops fighting. And then you have this whole Mexican internal struggle still, right? And and like you so pointedly said, right? Maximilian has a liberal vision for Mexico, but that's already taken by Juarez. <laughs> so it's like, like it, it seems like there's a serious identity crisis here. In the end, you know, he, he promises he's going to save Mexico, but in the end, the only way he can save it is by betraying it and, you know, betraying yeah. his values. Yeah. And you're right. I mean, using colonization as an inducement for volunteers to come and fight for the empire 
you know, and I try to show in the book that they, you know, they come from Barcelona, they come from yeah. Warsaw, they come from Minsk, right. uh, they come from Bari, they, you know, Sicily, they come from Prussia, they come from uh, the Rhineland, and um, <clears throat> you know, he's in in effect these these soldiers. The vision is that they'll settle after six years of service, hmm. but in effect, he, you know, he's he's going to change Mexico. That this infusion of of military uh, talent and and ultimately farming talent is going to change the country, and that that's maybe the first sense of the first betrayal. It should be said that the the Mexican Republic recognized from the beginning that it, to be stable it needed a denser population. I mean that was the problem mm -hmm. in Texas, uh, and even the Juarez government was willing to uh, provide land for people who are willing to come and settle and be productive, and above all, if they would come and fight for the republic. So. This is a bargain that both sides are willing to offer, but it, it really does in, suggest in the long term that um, the racial vision that some advocates for the Mexican empire had articulated, that this was going to be a defense of, of, of Latin, you know, Latinity, um, of Latin America against the Anglo-Saxon invader, um, that, you know, turns out not to be a sustainable vision because this is, Ethnically, it's socially speaking, Mexico is going to be transformed in either either context. Right. Now, the the other part that I was very very intrigued by, because you know, it's sort of like I this this goes very much like Andrew will have to take me down in a minute here because I'm <laughs> going to go rabbit hole. <laughs> but you know, when you like. When we look at like U.S. scholarship related to Maximilian, he's always like everything there is like, oh, Napoleon is just pulling the strings behind the scene. It's all Napoleon's doing. But that's not the thing you're telling us. You, you, you don't seem to agree that Maximilian is just a puppet that it's put there and kind of some other people are pulling the strings and kind of moving his arms and legs. It's, he's very much an independent minded guy. Yeah, that's that's right. I mean, and of course, Maximilian would be the first to bristle at the suggestion that he's a puppet of anyone. He's he has a very high-minded persona, high mm -hmm. high-minded sense of self. Um, and I, I think that the you know what makes it clear that this is a vision that's not Napoleon the Third's, but actually a broader vision that's embraced by conservative Mexicans is the fact that. The idea of a monarchy for Mexico goes back, back quite a ways, and that there are several other candidates that are put forward, um, <clears throat> including the Duke of Cambridge, Queen Victoria's cousin, going back to the 1840s. There is this sense, I think for me, Texas is really the catalyst. The uh, Europeans are absolutely astonished by the speed with which Mexico uh, you know, can, can lose Texas, and then Texas can be incorporated into the United States. And then what that portends for the American Republic. Um, and I, so I think it's the trauma of Texas. It's a really a different topic, but I'll just raise it briefly now. The trauma of Texas is what prompts Mexican conservatives to begin to think very seriously about how they can defend themselves against the eventual absorption by the United States. Uh, of course, the, the war between the U.S. and Mexico uh, will you know, is part of that trauma, too, that, that comes out of the annexation of Texas. But even, even uh, before that war in 1842, Gutierrez de Estrada, the, the, uh, you know, one of the architects and visionaries of a, of a Mexican monarchy, of a European dynastic family ruling Mexico, um, he, he is, um, you know, he's talking to, to he's, it's, if it's a British monarch, it doesn't matter. It could be an Austrian, it could be a French. They, they court a number of, different possible monarchs. Uh, they go to the Orleanist family in France. Um, they, you know, they go to Lord Aberdeen in, in, in Britain. Uh, they go, uh, in fact, to the Duke of Modena uh, in Italy um, uh, to try to find someone who's going to take on this role. And uh, so, you know, Maximilian, I mean, he he's, he's uh, I think, so he's the last in a long line of candidates for the throne. It's by no means... Uh, predetermined that uh, that he's going to be the one, uh, but he's you know he's given the option of being king of Greece. He's given the option maybe of being king of Poland, but neither of these quite fit 
his ambition. So mm -hmm. it is a it is an ambition. It's it's fully his vision that gets him there. It's not that he's he's you know being controlled from the Elysee uh, or controlled from Paris. He's um, you know he's he's fully uh, the architect of the vision, uh, and it's his vision that gets him there. Well, um, so kind of jumping on 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 Niels's point. Um... Definitely, uh, when I went into this as well, um, I was imagining Napoleon III pulling the strings, um, Maximilian just being essentially a puppet. Um, and obviously, he is anything but. Um, there's a just, there's a complete separation. Once once uh, the U.S. Civil War ends, uh, Napoleon pulls back, and it, and, it, and it's done. He's by he's 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 on his own. Um, and just uh, as an anecdote, um, I, my wife and I went to Paris yesterday <laughs> and we went to the Louvre and I looked around to see if there was anything uh, that maybe would show any type of trace or memory of, um, of, of Maximilian and the Mexican Empire. And there's nothing. There's nothing at all. And apparently, there's nothing in the museums, in Napoleon's apartments. There's nothing. Hmm. So I don't know exactly um, how much of an impact uh, or how much of a legacy Napoleon wanted Maximilian to have after pulling back. It's a, you know, it's a really good point. And I, I think what it gets at is the fact that Napoleon, the, that in, in a way, Mexico really represents the beginning of the end for the for Napoleon III and the, the, the second, the French Second Empire, that um, you, the, he has this grand vision of Mexico and that Mexico is going to be the key for checking the United States, but also for French and, and European access to, the, to Asia. Um, I mean, that, that they're profoundly concerned about the Pacific and how do you get to the Pacific and Mexico being the key to that. But, uh, you know, with once the Civil War is over, the U.S. can focus on Mexico and it's clear that that uh, France is going to, if it wants to avoid a war with the United States, you know, which the U.S. doesn't want, obviously, having been exhausted by the Civil War. But um, but the U.S. is serious. Um, Secretary of State Seward makes it clear that this isn't going to last you know, it's going to be a matter of months, not years, uh, and this adventure is going to have to end. So, um, you know, the, the 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 withdrawals begin. The the French soldiers begin, and ultimately, the European volunteers will withdraw as well, for the most part. Um, but it's important to recognize that also what's going on in the back of 1866 is though, um, of course, 1864 is the German-Danish War, which um, you know, a, a, an obscure reference, but I'm sure many of your listeners will get this, that, you know, this is when Prussia and Austria go to war against Denmark over Schleswig and Holstein. Um, and what this really represents is that the, the rise of Prussia as the leading German state. Uh, and that's a direct threat to French hegemony on the European continent. Mm. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, Napoleon III's eyes are open. You know, my problems are a lot closer to home. Um, as desirable as Mexico might be, I need to worry about what's going on right on my doorstep. Two years later, Prussia defeats Austria in, in, in war in 1866. And by then, he's absolutely frantic about um, getting ready for what looks like a conflict with Prussia. I mean, you know, Germany didn't exist when he came to power effectively. And all of a sudden, under his watch, it's become a formidable challenge to uh, to French hegemony on the European continent, so so there's that too, and then of course uh, ultimately the Franco-Prussian War, which brings Napoleon III's downfall. So this is part of a series of events, you know. And, and Andrew, I'm glad you brought that up. The uh, you know the uh, the the alarm bells are going off in, for Napoleon III uh, once the American Civil War is over. The window has closed. The the Mexican uh, initiative, as brilliant as it might have been, uh, no longer is an option. So, first of all, 
glad you're saying that, and I hope a lot of <laughs> a lot of peers that I constantly have in my mind listen to it as well and read your book because that is exactly right. We need to understand sort of this that interplay of European power politics impact on on the American continent in, in all its facets, like this, this this broad picture that you're really nicely there they're highlighting. Um, but that kind of raises sort of the question, what is the French and Napoleon's role once Maximilian is on the ground and the empire, the Mexican empire is established? We're sort of out of the, this intervention into like, like, are they like support? Are they assistance? Are they kind of like, like I don't know. <laughs> what, how, how would we best classify the French during this? Well, so they're, they're the organizers, right? Remember, at the, at the beginning, it, it's it's the Spanish and the British and the French who all go to Veracruz. Um, <clears throat> of course, they have different visions, uh, and uh, nominally, uh, this is about making Mexico pay European investors who've 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 invested in Mexico and who are no longer getting their dividends and are beginning to worry that, that their capital. Is, is going to be lost too. Um, you know, if Spain peels away once they realize they're not going to be the winners in this enterprise, the British aren't, you know, although they share concerns about the United States, they're not convinced that this is the way to address those concerns. And ultimately it's France that, uh, that undertakes this mission alone. The vision is for the French to stay long enough to get the empire established and then for the volunteers from Europe to take over, uh, volunteers from Europe as well as uh, uh, Mexican supporters, uh, that is to say native Mexican supporters of the empire. The problem is that the, the promise uh, that was made to the supporters of the empire was that the Mexican people themselves craved an empire, that they were, you know, they were monarchists. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem was that they were being intimidated by the, by the Mexican Republic. Uh, and uh, that if, you know, once the intervention began, the people could come out into the open and show their true colors, that they welcomed the intervention, they welcomed the Europeans, and that they would welcome a European monarch. Uh, this turns out, of course, not to be true. And then the story becomes, yeah, well, what they need is the presence of the monarch himself. And Maximilian isn't here yet. So when he comes, then everybody will settle down and, and the, you know, the monarchist majority will step forward. Um, everybody, you know, is willing to tell these, you know, on the imperial side, willing, willing to tell these comforting stories uh, about how it's all going to play out. But in fact, you know, when it's, what's clear is that there's order under the empire only when troops are present. Oh. You know, the, the French, the commander, Achille Bazin, you know, leads armies uh, or orders armies into different parts of Mexico. And the, and the metaphor I give is like a vessel, you know, passing through the water that, yes, it's there, but as soon as it, and, 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 and wherever they are, there's no insurgency, but as soon as they move on, the insurgency yeah. just moves back. Yeah. Um, and so what that means is you're in a situation where, you know, effectively you're in a civil war. Mm -hmm. This is, these are, you know, guerrilla, um, Combat, so they're going to happen whenever you don't have sufficient forces on hand. So that's the, you know, that that was the 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 vision comes apart pretty quickly, but it comes apart in pieces. And people are willing to delude themselves. People on the imperial side are willing to delude themselves, um, pretty far into it. I mean, ultimately, when the French leave, the story that Maximilian tells himself is that yeah, the French were the problem, um, and they the always way, are. They always are, right? So we, the only way we can make the, this empire work is to make it fully Mexican. And that's his last play is that, well, let's, you know, I, I'm not going to fight the French withdrawal. I'm going to accelerate the French withdrawal. I'm going to kick them out mm. and and make my army a Mexican army. The the remaining European forces, the, you know, the, 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 the European volunteers are, are sidelined. And he, in his final play, to shore up the empire, he takes an overwhelmingly Mexican Mexican army uh, with him, thinking that yeah, now people will see that I'm a Mexican too, and they'll rally to the empire. Uh, but it's you know, like all the other visions, it's an illusion. It it does kind of 
hate tooting my own horn, but it sort of reminds me of the chapter and I forget which chapter we wrote that in when Duncan and I wrote our our book on the uh, Civil War in the Age of Nationalism that, um, and this was Duncan's words, not mine. He, he It was his creation that sort of like Vietnam, right? He classified Vietnam as sort of Napoleon's revenge <laughs> on the United States. But it's when you think of it, right, it's always the same. Like there's these empires going in with grand visions into Iraq, Vietnam, like, Afghanistan, wherever, and then like the reality hits, and it's like all these people don't want you as an overlord, like, I can't like Algeria, it. right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like it's it's so crazy. Yes, the, the idea of a war of liberation is. Um, I mean, it's a, apparently a, a a vision that can be recycled because uh, even yeah. you know, as you point out, even in our own times, it hasn't gone away. People can readily convince themselves that there's a high-minded goal that they're pursuing in, you know, whether it's Vietnam or Iraq or Algeria or Southeast Asia. Ukraine, I suppose, too, now, right? Well, maybe from yeah, Putin's also side. from the other side of, of yes. Ukraine, from the Russian side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. from the Russian side, of course. Uh, um, yeah. yeah, you know, in terms of your, the, it's a good point about Vietnam because, um, you know, one of the arguments that that was made about Mexico was that Mexico was being taken over by the troublemakers who had been suppressed successfully in Europe in 1848. Uh, the, the 48ers are the problem. Uh, and it's democracy. And by democracy, they mean everything associated, not, not just a political democracy, but social democracy. Uh -huh. And that, you know, it's these, um, these, these, the, the Juarez is operating according to the same principles. Uh, some of his critics, you know, will will reference the terror. You know, that whenever you get a republic, you get terror. Whenever you get a republic, you get threats to property. Uh, and these are all, you know, it's the same struggle where it's whether it's the 1848 revolutions in Europe or, uh, or the American you know, Civil War. I mean, the the yeah. discourse is exactly the same. Yeah. Yes. The reign yes. of terror. The reign of terror. The reign of terror. The reign of terror. Yeah. Yeah. The French Revolution <laughs> and its long shadow. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's the same combat. The, the 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 revolution is on the march, uh, and, and we need to be ready to confront it wherever it is. Yeah. To to not go further down that rabbit hole, <laughs> as fun as it is, um, I was like. I want to stick with Maximilian for a moment longer because it's such a fascinating, Andrew mentioned as we prepared for it, that that was something that he enjoyed as well and what a lot of questions about. But I really enjoyed sort of the ending, right? Like, like I'm not thinking it, it like we can, we can see if we want to talk about Quartero and um, the, the trials that Maximilian has. But I was thinking about the memory, right? Of like the, the memory chapel and the, the importance of that to restore relations between Austria and uh, and Mex and Mexico and like like you have been in in Vienna. Embarrassingly, I lived in Austria for a year and I have not. So, is there anything there? Like, do how do the like how do the Austrians remember Maximilian as this whole Mexico thing, or vice versa? Do the Mexicans still remember? anything about Maximilian? The good question. I think that the, the Mexicans do, um, uh, in fact, one time when I was down there uh, working, there was a major exhibition going on about the Second Empire, and all of the posters featured one of the official portraits of Maximilian as emperor. You know, big, large-scale advertisements in the area around Chapultepec uh, and the Anthropology Museum. So uh, it's not something that the that you know Mexico shies away from. I mean, it's an important part of the national story of how Mexico, as an independent nation, established itself. Uh, but um, there there was a kind of, uh, and that works for the left in Mexico. For the right, there was, uh, especially in the eighteen nineties, a kind of nostalgia uh, for the, and I, I in the book I tried to. Um, you know, to, to mention this, um, the 
th this idea that Maximilian is a kind of savior and that he is a Christ-like figure who gave his life for Mexico as a redemptive sacrifice, that works really well uh, in the Catholic press it, as a way of trying to capture what was lost and also a way of demonizing the public, which remains problematic for Mexican conservatives. So to elevate Maximilian is to is is not to talk about a folly, but in fact to emphasize a lost opportunity. That this was when, a, sorry, a great. When you, when you when you say remains, are you saying remains? Uh, it remained in the in the nineteenth century, or remains today? In the nineteenth century, I think really represents the zenith, um, you know, especially during the the, the Porfiriato, mm -hmm. um, where this. Uh, Porfirio Diaz as the president of Mexico is incarnating a vision of a strong leader who can keep Mexico together and, and bring it into the future, order and progress as as uh, key objectives. So there is a place. I mean, there. I would say that the empire has a usable is part of a usable past for Mexican conservatives, especially in the in the late nineteenth and early twentieth century. Today, I you know it's harder to say. Um, it's certainly for the now, if you think about memory for the Austrians, I mean, Andrew, you said you, you know, there were no traces of of Mexico in in Paris and in the Louvre that you could observe. And I think I think you're right. I mean, this is a, an unfortunate episode from the point of view of the French, let alone um, the, the French Second Empire. You know, it's a catastrophic foreign policy failure for the Austrians. Um, you know, Maximilian was kind of a um, straw head. I think they've latched on to the idea, uh, a, a common idea at the time, that this was, a, you know, a, a Habsburg going off on an adventure, a foolish one at that. By the time the the, uh, the empire has collapsed, um, I try to, I su suggest in the book that, the you know, the Mexican volunteers, as they were known, the, the Austrians and, and other um, people who's, Croatians and Slovenians and right. and Poles and others coming out of the Habsburg Empire, those who had gone to Mexico were treated very poorly when they came back. You know, they come back destitute, in rags, um, and uh, you know they have a hard time getting scratching together enough money to get back to their to their homes. Um, there just is no interest at all. These people are a reminder, and this is often the case, as we know, in imperial wars. Then when these ventures fail, when the soldiers come back, they're treated very, very poorly simply because they are an unpleasant reminder of a failed initiative. Right. Um, and of course, they're coming back at time of failure for Austria itself, too, having just defeat, been defeated by the Prussians in 66, too. So it's it's yes. it's a confluence of very bad situations. And like, People yeah, are I mean, really yeah, they're they're not. You know, it's it, it's a, some of them. The best that they can do, the best that Austria can offer, is well. You know, you can join the Austrian army. <laughs> you know, and you can imagine what soldiers would think. You know, they've just left this horrific yeah. experience uh, yeah. in the army of the imperial uh, of imperial Mexico. Yeah. So okay, so you can join the Austrian army as a way of supporting yourself because many of these men come back in uh, in in poor condition. The, the return of, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, but the, the conditions probably would have been considerably better uh, in the Austrian army as opposed to the Imperial Mexican army. That That's right. You know, many of the volunteers were never paid, let alone, Ugh. you know, given, given um, any sort of fulfillment of the promise they were right. offered of land and prosperity in Mexico after. Oh, I was thinking of drinking water and, and heat. Yeah. Yeah. Guys taking pot shots at you, right? When you pass yeah, through course. a village, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, if you came back in '67, I mean, at that stage, Austria is at peace. So, at least until the First World War, you were safe. So, it wouldn't have been too bad a deal. But, yeah, still. Maybe not what they were expecting. And, yeah, yeah, and, of course. And, of course, they, they were never paid in, in Mexico. I mean, even. Yeah. They've gone for months without pay, and uh, just you're screwed. <laughs> screwed. Yeah. yeah. Good God, That's terrible. So, um, uh, to kind of bring this back to the Civil War, mm -hmm. um, in my memory, 
thinking about the Mexican Empire, it was a little, I, I thought it was a little bit before. But we're talking about, when we're talking about Maximilian, we're actually talking about the very end of the American Civil War and through presidential reconstruction. Mm -hmm. So Maximilian is coming into his own as emperor as the Confederacy is crumbling and the United States is scrambling to figure out what to do with the former, the rebellious South. In what ways do you think uh, reconstruction of the American South informed the situation that either Juarez um, was exploiting to make inroads from the North or the realities that Maximilian uh, was having to deal with pushing, trying to push and extend his, his spheres of influence? So yeah, those are really, really. Sorry, that's, a, that's a big question. A big question. Um, He's good at those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Those are, as historians, those are the ones we like. Yeah. Um, you know, I think what's interesting is that the the kind of the people who show up are are not rank and file Confederates. These are high profile Confederates, hmm. uh, and that. Um, you know, starting with Matthew Maury, but, you know, you get um, you know, Henry Watkins Allen, a Texan who was elected governor of Louisiana in the twilight months of the Confederacy. Um, uh, John Magruder, who was commander in chief of Confederate forces in Texas. Sterling Price, governor of Missouri. Um, you get, uh, uh, well, and then you get uh, General uh, James Slaughter, who who entered into the negotiations claiming he could bring 25,000 Confederate soldiers with him. Um, so in, you know, these, these people pretty clearly feel as though they, they maybe share that sentiment expressed by Maury that they've, they've had it up to here with republics. They've, they've had enough of republics mm -hmm. and they're looking for a, a homeland, a new homeland. They're, they're really giving up as Americans. Um, and it's only because the, the empire can't deliver on its promises that they end up going back. Um, uh, one of them actually torches his, his plantation before he leaves. He, he doesn't, doesn't want to leave anything of value behind. Um, it, uh, so they expect the worst. Um, they, they're going to lose their property and slaves. Um, they, depending on how reconstruction plays out, they may, may new, uh, lose land to the idea of 40 acres and a mule, um, they they uh, have no hopes for uh, their future. Juarez, on the other hand, I'm going to take the other side, Juarez is now optimistic. Uh, he, you know, he's managed not to leave Mexican soil uh, throughout this. You know, he stays as the figurehead of a government in exile, internal exile, uh, and things only get better as the war winds down. Now, it's true the war in the Trans-Mississippi West, you know, uh, simmers, continues to simmer after Appomattox in April 65, uh, you know, Juneteenth, right? Uh, it's not until uh, months later that the end of the war finally comes to Texas uh, and uh, the Trans-Mississippi West more broadly. But conditions are already getting better. Uh, Phil Sheridan uh, is sent to Texas to you know, to finalize the situation and to support from a position of safety, support the Mexican Republic. Mm. Um, African-American soldiers are involved in a raid on Matamoros, crossing the Rio Grande into Mexican territory and a clear provocation that the empire imperial forces don't want to accept because they're afraid that, you know, there'll be some incident, some loss of life there on the frontier uh, uh, as in the case of the, the war over Texas, the war between the U.S. and Mexico, something that's going to spark war with, between the U.S. and Imperial Mexico. So they end up retreating under this pressure. The pressure from the United States in military terms is not great, but it is significant in the sense that it makes um, the Imperial forces much more careful about how close they get to the frontier, how close, how close they get to American soil, and, and what they do and how they respond to provocations originating from it. So 
did the United States recognize uh, ever recognize Maximilian in the Empire or no. the Republic? Uh, no, they 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 don't recognize the Empire, and and you know Maximilian can't understand this. He thinks that they ought to, um, but yeah, you know, these overtures are are <coughs> are rebuffed. Um, the Mexican Republic has a, a very sharp guy in D.C., Matias Romero, ambassador to the United States, who's in close contact with Seward, the American Secretary of State, keeping him well informed about what's going on in Mexico, what the empire is doing, what the French are doing. Um, you know, the, 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 the Republic, the Mexican Republic doesn't have a lot of resources, but they put smart people where it matters the most. Romero in D.C., um, you know, is basically, you know, he's holding the hand of Seward. Uh, Seward's, you know, his his political values are the right ones. He supports the Republic. Um, and Romero works that relationship very successfully. In Europe, um, they have um, a um, Jesus Terran, who um, is moving around. Obviously, you know, he doesn't have a great budget, but he's able to go to different parts of Europe and try to lobby on behalf of the Republic. Um, he actually goes and talks to Maximilian before Maximilian leaves and says, you know, tries to tell him Mexico is not what you think it is. Mm. And Mexico is not going to welcome you as a monarch. These are lies. But, uh, you know, he ends up writing back to Juarez and saying, you know, this guy's a pumpkin head. In other words, he, he it's, un, it's unfair because I think Maximilian is a smart guy, but he is prone to fantasy and um and and Terra and Jesus Tehran a really smart guy just can't break through by that time you know Maximilian has has really embraced the dream of of a Habsburg Mexico and he can't let go oh, go sorry ahead. go, go ahead, ahead Andrew no, I'll follow up but go ahead first okay so um, I, do like I know we're, pumpkin head we're getting kind of close to the end of the pumpkin head. I love that. Um, we're getting kind of close to the end of the of, of your time. So um, my I think my last question is about the title Habsburgs on the Rio Grande. Mm -hmm. How realistic was it that the Habsburgs ever might have reached the Rio Grande? Yeah, so this this exists mostly in terms of the the vision of what the empire could be um, and what the um, that vision of course is Maximilian's vision that this is a, a Habsburg revival it's a Habsburg renaissance and that imperial Mexico will recover its glory um, the glory that it experienced under Habsburg rule under what during the era of Charles V and that vision includes not just the revival of Mexico within the boundaries established by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo at the end of the U.S.-Mexico War in 1847 uh, and 48, um, but Mexico, as it uh, as its territory was defined when it was New Spain, and that in implies a, a clawing back of territory lost in that U.S.-Mexico War. Now, of course, this vision never gets anywhere near being realized. Uh, uh, or realizable, but that's the vision. Um, if you know, if you go to Miramare and you know, um, Niels, you're not far away, and neither are you. Come, come to think of it, Andrew, uh, I hope you get a chance to go because one of the murals um, there shows um, high on the wall a you know a painting, a map of Mexico. Cortez is standing by, Columbus is standing by in the corners, but it shows it in its in its at its greatest extent. And that's the vision, you know, that he has. It's the vision he puts up on the wall at his home in Miramare of a um, of a fully restored Mexico. Um, so he's really tapping into the you know Hobbs, the the glory days of the Habsburg Empire for his vision of uh, of the Habsburgs under his rule, uh, Mexico under his rule. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Well, it's a good point, yes. <laughs> Maybe we should do a appeal trip, Andrew. <laughs> I'm um, looking at the, the castle. Uh, it's a beautiful castle. I don't know why I didn't look before, but um, 
very 19th century, and you can tell that he had his was very closely uh, a very close eye on the uh, on the work and the architecture, and it's a very yeah. Maximilian esque palace. Yes, <laughs> it's really his vision. I mean, this is him showing himself as an architect um, yeah. and an interior designer. I mean, everything about it is a reflection of his personality and his vision. He, he's also an architect for the Fotikirche in Vienna, by the way. So he sees himself as someone who's, you know, multi-talented. And he is. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's a really talented guy. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, and if, if you, you know, if you get to Miramare, you want to, you know, most of us, you, you would walk through and say, wow, that's interesting. Oh, that's a nice painting. But, yeah, you know, if you look closely, you can see that starting with the Gothic, the neo-Gothic architecture, I mean, these crenellated turrets, you know, this is a guy who's living in a world, you know, created by Sir Walter Scott. It's, you know, 19th century Gothic romanticism. And oh. um, and he wants to live in it, right? And this is cosplay. Um, you know, this, he's, except he has the resources to make it real. Right. Where did his money actually come from? I mean, oh. <laughs> he, had the, he had the treasury, of course, but Yes and no, because at a certain point, obviously yeah. those funds were cut off. But how much yeah. did it cost, and where did the money to build this thing come from? He, he, he seems to get it. So he has an allowance as a member of the Habsburg family, and that supports him as a young man. You know, when um, when he's building Miramare, when he's voyaging to Brazil, uh, he has access to the family yacht, the Habsburg yacht. Uh, so, you know, there's a kind of infrastructural support, but he has a lot of wealth that comes. I think he has an allowance. And Charlotte brings a lot of money uh, with her. Um, she seems to be very good at investing. Uh, and between the two of them, they have, a, I think, a lot of resources to draw upon. When they get to Mexico, it gets more complicated. Um, the main source of revenue for Mexico comes from duties imposed on goods when they arrive and uh you know places like mazatlan on the pacific coast and san Bla and acapulco are important and so is tampico uh, uh on the gulf of mexico but most uh commercial traffic goes through veracruz and that's where the money is the catch is that that is controlled closely controlled by the french starting when they arrive and uh that means that the you know, the treasury is not something that he controls or that they control. Uh, they're in effect, you know, it's a really sad situation, but effectively they're on allowance. I mean, they have their own resources, but any, uh, you know, any support has to be controlled, is ultimately controlled by the French commander, Ashur Bazen. Um, you know, he's, and he's first of all going to pay his soldiers uh, and uh, before any of that trickles into the treasury of the, uh, of the Mexican empire. Well, and then ostensibly, uh, when uh, Maximilian formally accepts uh, the, the the crown in Charlotte, wouldn't they have renounced their their lifeline to both Austrian the Austrian purses and the Belgian? Uh, you know, that's not clear to me. Certainly, on the Belgian side, it's not at all clear that that Charlotte is cut off. Um, the Habsburgs. Uh, the family pact doesn't specify, I'd have to go back and look at it to be sure, but doesn't specify uh, how much of, of an allocation Maximilian is entitled to once he takes the title of Emperor of Mexico. Hmm. Crazy. I'm uh, done with my questions. <laughs> Well, I could uh, I could go for another hour, but yeah, I could too. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating book. Indeed. Well, this has been a pleasure, really. No, I, I I wanted actually to go back to one point that Andrew raised about like reconstruction because uh it is it is still somewhat of an overlooked theme to kind of think of like because Mexico goes through the civil wars and you got, you have the empire, um you have other countries in Latin America who have a similar situation. So they the United States is not the only country that sort of after a civil war, after a large conflict has to reconstruct. Um, and like, yes, we have like one book that has sort of attempted to look at it. And here I will, 
I will have to say like you did an amazing job with sort of the try on sort of the comparisons Maximilian does to kind of Jefferson Davis to kind of say, hey, the United States didn't punish this guy. Why am I being punished? So it was extremely fascinating to kind of see a much more detailed and more in-depth understanding of, of that sort of comparison on your part. But what I actually want to ask, <laughs> now that kind of, again, a little bit of sharing on your book is out, is kind of that, that tragedy, right? That So Juarez wins, the empire falls, Maximilian gets killed. But within 10 years, we get Diaz and the poor Fioriato. So like this entire liberal dream kind of like fails in many way, ways. And even though Diaz is not an emperor, he sort of is an emperor. So in, in, it sort of feels like Maximilian gets the last laugh in all of this in, in sort of the reconstruction of Mexico and how it's going to function in the future. Well, that's that's true. I mean, the, there there is a conservative party in Mexico, uh, and um, to the extent that Maximilian is, you know, a founding figure in that conservative party, um, you, you you could say yes. In, in in the long term, he 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 wins, uh, or at least he remains uh, an alternative uh, to the republic. Juarez, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, Andrew, you talked about going to the to the Louvre and looking for evidence in Canetero. Uh, there's a regional museum there that's really excellent, a uh, beautiful building. Besides, um, but it shows clearly anti-warist uh, works of art mm -hmm. um, that you know, suggesting that that the Juarez regime was the, you know, represented the rape of the Catholic Church. Uh, you know, you know, these are not. This is not a subtle rendering uh, of an artist's vision of the Republic. Uh, so, uh, you know, there the it's now a cold civil war, but there there there's evidence of it. Now, obviously, this is not the dominant vision, but if you go to more conservative parts of Mexico, and Cadetero is is among them, um, then then yeah, you 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 will see traces of of a more conservative vision for Mexico. You could do the same in, you know, in France too. I mean, you're in Poitiers. I mean, there's plenty of evidence of a more conservative vision of France and in, in Poitiers and other parts of the French West, the Vendée and so on. Uh, so they, these do live on, whether they, you know, whether these this particular vision, this more uh, counter-revolutionary vision even could ultimately prevail is, you know, unlikely, but, but, um, but it, it's not uh, entirely abolished either. It's it's funny when you say that because I still remember like, um, I forget how many years ago it was, but when Kevin Levine brought out his new book on Black Confederates and I, I met him in Atlanta and he gave, it, gave a presentation and in sort of the presentation, the aftermath, this point came up of like how, how Confederates were sort of this unique situation of losers being able to put up monuments and remembering the past. But when you really look at the below the surface, like right in Mexico, it's not the case. And like I know here in, in Wales, there's this old Dragon, Dragoon um, Club commemorative group and they dress up like First World War era Dragoons and have like a museum, which don't get me started on like the public <laughs> history and museum studies sort of <laughs> angle of like how the stuff is presented. But there is sort of like this nostalgia, right? That like in, in conservative circles, you look back at these like heroic figures of the past, even they were losers because they, you, you kind of, you want to make them into heroes of some sort. Yeah. And, and Neil, you've written far more on this than anyone I know about the, you know, the Atlantic civil wars and the, the civil wars of the Americas, Garibaldi. I mean, all of these people who, or involved in these struggles and those who lose it's true right. they uh, the idea of a lost cause is maybe most prominent in the american historiography but the lost cause that concept exists in virtually any right. uh you know in any defeated culture as part of its nostalgia it's part of its politics of memory 
yeah. thinking about conservative monarchism in France, and there's there's still this anti-revolutionary when? excellent Francais. Um, <laughs> you talked about Poitiers, and uh, one of the one of the kind of the, the original guys from Action Francaise, uh, the Marquis de Roux was from here and he you know, was a law professor here. And, uh, you know, he was in the inner circle of Charles Maurras's group in Paris, you know, with the, the beating up of Leon Bloom and all these people. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there, there's definitely a culture of, of defeat here as well, but yeah. in a different yeah. sense. Wow, crazy. But um, we are at the end of today, I think. Um, Jonas, Ray, you have other things that you need to do. And Andrew needs to get ready for probably what's the last week of the school year soon. Or... Two weeks. <laughs> almost. Almost. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, um, Ray, again, it was a great pleasure. Uh, first of all, if you have, or last of all, or something along those lines, if you're interested in Ray's book, Habsburgs on the Rio Grande, The Rise and Fall of the Second Mexican Empire, um, Harvard University Press, or other bookstores will have it as well if you're not wanting and to order by from them. Just, let, me, let me add this, that we were saying this earlier before, the, before we started recording. It's a very accessible book. Exactly. It's a very good book. It's one of the, I would say, one of the best that has come out in in recent years on on Mexico. Uh, well, and then a great of, reinterpretation. Yeah. And then in terms of writing style, I mean, it's definitely, yeah. um, we didn't talk about the audience, but it's very much in between uh, scholars and a popular audience. So yeah. it's writing for everybody. It's very... Yeah. And if you're an, especially if you're a Civil War historian, have read certain books, it is definitely worth picking up because Absolutely. it's a very different and good interpretation of of this period from another perspective. Uh, but then, thank you again, Ray. Thanks for joining me and thank Andrew you, here thank today. You. And um, thank you very much, Ray. It was a, it was a good it was a great time. Yeah, good conversation. Thanks to you both, Andrew Niels. It was my pleasure.